Thank you for that uh, wonderful opening to worship. What better way could there be to open a worship service? Thank you for joining me this morning. Even though we can't be together in this place, we can be together in heart and in spirit to worship God. I am Reverend Suzanne Goodwin. I am so pleased to serve as the pastor here at Mason First United Methodist Church. And if you are joining us for the first time this morning, we are so glad to have you with us. And we look forward to the time when we can meet you in person in the sanctuary. On Monday night, we are uh, going to be holding our first church council meeting of the year. That is an important meeting in that that is where we approve the budget for the upcoming year. So we have um, taken the pledges that you have sent in, and if you are still, um, if you still have your pledge card and haven't turned it in yet, we'll still take that. But that helps us to put together a responsible, responsible budget for the ministries that we plan to accomplish this coming year. And so we'll report on that church council meeting in the next worship service. Let us join our hearts and spirits in worship in our call to worship. The Spirit of God is upon us. We are called to be God's people. The Spirit of God is upon us. We are called to be the body of Christ. Let us worship God who binds us together. Come, let us worship God who gives our lives meaning and purpose. Let's sing together our opening hymn, O Church of God United. one of our um, great privileges um, to worship a God who listens to us, who hears us, who wants us to be in conversation with God. And so it is a great opportunity for us each time we worship together to join our hearts in prayer. And there is so much in our world that we can offer up to God. We don't have to carry burdens alone. Our God cares about the condition of our world and the condition of our lives. As we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, I would uh, say that we should uh, keep in mind that we have members of our, con our congregation who are battling with COVID and exposure to COVID. So um, please just ever be in prayer for that. Lois Smith is recovering from hip surgery. And of course, we are continuing to pray for Ken Gettler, Dick Magzig, and Lou Tibbetts. Let us now go to God in prayer. O holy and loving God, 
On this day of worship, we take time set aside to be in your presence, to appreciate that you have created us and claimed us as your family. We appreciate that you are a God who summons us to a dedicated time to sit in your company and to remember that you are not a distant God, but a God who loves us closely. This week, oh God, we give you thanks that our greatest fears of civil unrest did not come to be realized. We are breathing a sigh of relief that once more our country has found the resolve to move through a transition of leadership peacefully, even when we do not all agree. Help us to remember in the days ahead that you, O oh God, must be the king of our hearts in order for the governance of our democracy to be effective. For if we do not answer your command to first love you and to love one another, then we will never truly know peace. You, O oh God, are the compass that gives direction to peace and prosperity. Holy God, we acknowledge in this hour of worship that this time spent with you is essential to reminding us of who we are, who we are in relationship to you, who we are because you have created us to be something and someone special. Help us to be brave enough to claim the gifts and graces you have given us and to answer your call to ministry, to go where you send, to speak the words of hope and love that the world needs to hear. Help us to be people who live as recognizable disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord, we so love our church. We thank you for the ways you have blessed it and sustained it over the years. We are looking forward to a new year, and our hearts are open to your calling and the opportunities that you will set before us to serve where there is need. Give us wisdom for discernment and courage for response. God of grace and healing, we lift to you this morning the precious members of our congregation who are battling COVID, who are battling cancer, who are struggling with frailties of the body and shadows of the mind. We ask for healing and comfort and an easing of physical and emotional pain. And Lord, we know that you are with those who are in the last phases of this earthly life. Give them and those who love them the peace that comes from the assurance of your presence and the joy that comes from the hope of an eternity in your kingdom. Lord, we continue to also lift the leaders of our communities, our nation, and our world. Inspire them and give them wisdom and courage to lead with grace and care for all of your people of all kinds, in all places. Holy and loving God, we are ever thankful for the love you have shown for us especially in the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If we were here together at this time, we would offer our gifts to God. But we still bring our gifts to God with generosity. And I want to share with you something that has been happening over the last couple of weeks, something I think that you should know about. The lesson that I have learned is that generosity breeds generosity. Generosity brings generosity. Since the night of the living nativity, where people drove through and experienced the Christmas story that we offered to this community, People asked that evening, could they make a donation? 
And we told them that was our gift. That was our gift to the community. We wanted to offer that without price. But cards and letters have been coming in from people sending in offerings, people who are not from our church. And people have been coming into the church office. And just in the last week, we have had three people come into the church or work through another member of the church who have said, I want to give to the good work that you're doing. I trust you as a church to um, handle this gift and make sure that it helps somebody in need. And so we have been able to help specifically a couple of families and to further um, add to the tiny pantry where we supply food for hunger relief in our community. The work that we do in this church inspires others to also be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so our gifts are important. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your generosity. Would you join me in singing together our doxology? know that the University of Wisconsin has a concrete canoe club. It's an engineering club where they actually work to design concrete canoes that float. Northwestern University has a happiness club whose mission is to spread happiness around campus. University of Michigan, and you may not find this surprising, University of Michigan has a squirrel club whose mission is to um, help take care of the squirrels on campus, to feed them and make sure that they're okay. The College of William and Mary has a Wizards and Muggles Club. And SUNY, the State University of New York, has a Cheese Club. The list of interesting clubs on college campuses is a lot longer, and it's a very intriguing list. Just by their names, you can't help but wonder what their club does and who started it and why they started it and what do they stand for? What do they do at their average meetings? Whenever I, I start a new confirmation class with young folks who are getting ready to make the decision to join the church, I ask them as they're on the cusp of this important decision, don't they want to know what they're getting into? I mean, I'd want to know what was expected of me if I was going to join the Concrete Canoe Club. And I hope that they care about what is expected of them as they become members of a church. I ask them, do you want to know what the rules are? Do you want to know whether we expect you to do a funky dance in the moonlight or to eat a live chicken? Do you have to wear your clothes backwards on the third Tuesday of the month? What are the practices? What are the beliefs? What does this church stand for? What is it that you're joining? And I would want to be, be able to respond when someone asks me, why did you join that church? Why aren't you a Quaker or a Catholic or a Baptist? What are the things that we believe that make us Methodist? This morning, we are continuing our series called What We Believe, which was inspired both by my frustration at not being able to hold a confirmation class for our youth or to be able to um, offer a new member class for our latest newcomers. But more importantly, several longtime members have said to me something along the lines of, I'd like a confirmation class, which says to me 
that from time to time it's important for us to revisit what we stand for and what we believe. Two weeks ago, we began our series with a remembrance of baptism and a celebration of Holy Communion, the two sacraments of the United Methodist Church. Now, I wouldn't normally start a confirmation class with a review of the sacraments. The reason that we started the series with that is because that first Sunday was Baptism of Our Lord's Sunday, which is observed by churches all over the world. It's the time where we remember Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. So it made sense to start with that as that's what we were celebrating. Then last week, we spoke of the United Methodist belief and practice of social justice as commanded by Jesus in his teachings to love God and love God's people. And again, from a teaching perspective, that also might not have been an early lesson, but since it was also Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, and since we were about to head into a week where, as a nation, we're searching for a healing that demands that we all step up our game in terms of how we treat one another, it was also a timely message. Today, we're continuing our series, What We Believe, with another defining Methodist belief that comes directly from Scripture. And that essential belief is that we are all called to discipleship and to ministry. In the United Methodist Book of Discipline, there's a section called the Ministry of All Christians. And this is a really important part of who we are. Let's take a look at a couple of scriptures that point us to this essential understanding of who we are as Christians. Our first comes from Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. On the morning when the women at the tomb discovered Jesus had been resurrected, Jesus spoke to the women, instructing them to go to the disciples and ask them to meet Jesus in Galilee. Here's where our scripture begins. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where, to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our second scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to uh, share some excerpts from that, um, but if you want to read more, just look up that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it is an in-depth um, look at this particular topic. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another by the same Spirit, faith, to another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it 
any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were, the sense, were, were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in each body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. This is the word of God for the people of God, for which we say thanks be to God. What is church to you? Is it a place? A building with a steeple and beautiful stained glass? Is it an event? A service that lasts precisely 60 minutes, no more and no less? Is it an assembly of people striving together to grow in relationship to God and to each other? What does church do for you? Does it inspire you? Does it help you find your place in the world? Does it build you up and send you forth with the Holy Spirit? What does the church demand of you? Does it drain you or does it give you purpose? Does it ask you to give, ask you to serve, ask you to grow? Does it ask you to witness? Is church a noun? Is church a verb? Is it a building or is it people? Is it refuge or is it a launching pad to the outside world? Tomorrow night, our church council will meet, the first meeting of the new year, and the questions that I just asked are always present. The answers to those questions provide the undercurrent of how we will flow through the important days ahead. And yet far too many churches don't ask these important questions of themselves and their constituents. It is far too easy to simply think of the church as a building, a place where we go once a week for what we hope will be a nicely put together and somewhat entertaining experience that sets us up for the week ahead. We hope we'll get something out of it that causes us to think, at least for a moment or two, beyond the parking lot. We hope that the music will be good. We hope that the pastor will not be too boring. And when church is over, we expect the building to stand there, a stalwart monument to God, reminding the community that God got here first and still watches over us, right? The church, if you will, has done a terrible job over the years of helping to people to understand the fullness of what it means to be church. Church is more than just a word. It's a concept that was built on the idea that the assembly of God's people would be a representation of the body of Christ. Let me say that again. Church is a community of people who are the living embodiment of Christ. So church is not just a building, and it's not just a worship service, and it's certainly not limited to a square city block on the downtown square. Church is the work of God. Church is the energy of the Holy Spirit. Church is the expression of teachings of Jesus Christ. Church is God's people gathering. Church is worship and service and music and refuge and sending and going and doing. Church is a body of people who go, go therefore and make disciples of all God's people. Church is a verb. Church is activity. Church should be the visible expression of the agape love that Jesus taught us. And the church is not confined to Sunday. Church is done seven days a week. Church is happening wherever two or more are gathered in Jesus' name. Church is happening when you deliver meals to people who need a little help. Church is happening in classes that meet over Zoom and conversations that happen with the stylist who's fixing your hair. 
Churches happening in quilts being made and meals being served in a cold downtown park. Churches going on all the time. It's really important that we pry our understanding of church outside the brick walls that contain it. Because the churches that li limit themselves to that understanding will not be here much longer. And that's exactly what John Wesley and his brother Charles and their friends strove to move beyond. The birth of the Methodist movement was a busting out of the dying Anglican church and its once a week tepid worship services that rarely even offered the gift of Holy Communion. It was a mighty wind, a breath of the Holy Spirit, moving through a community of faithful young men who helped bring church outside the walls and into the world where the word of God and the love of Christ was needed as much as people need bread and water. And it was a recommissioning of God's people to be the disciples that Jesus calls us to be. One of the foundational theologies of the United Methodist Church is that we believe that all people are called to ministry. That God has gifted each person uniquely to reflect the glory of God. Some of us may be hands some of us may be ears, some of us may be feet, but all of us uniquely reflect God's love and God's glory. All of us are created and called by God to play a role in the building of God's kingdom right here on earth. We're often raised through our experience in the church to believe that the pastor is the minister. And I'll talk a little more about the role of the ordained pastor in a minute. But we often forget that we're all called to be in ministry. I want to read this little section from the Book of Discipline in the section called Ministry of All Christians. The ministry of the laity flows from a commitment to Christ's outreaching love. Lay members of the United Methodist Church are, by history and calling, active advocates of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every layperson is called to carry out the Great Commission. Every layperson is called to be missional. The witness of the laity, their Christ-like examples of everyday living, as well as their sharing of their own faith, experiences of the gospel, is the primary evangelistic ministry through which all people will come to know Christ and how the United Methodist Church will fulfill its mission. Statements like these in our Book of Discipline reflect John Wesley's Methodist movement, where he organized people into small groups called bands or societies that met to study scripture together and to organize themselves into missional units and activities. This is where John Wesley found ministry for women to be particularly effective. Women were really good at organizing and leading and encouraging these small groups. And by their active leadership and the rallying of all people to get involved in doing the work of the church, it allowed for ordained pastors, all men in those days, to serve larger territories and to organize and to spread the gospel even farther. In these small bands and societies, everyone was offered a role to play, a purpose to serve according to their gifts and graces. Church did not just happen in a brick building with a steeple. Ministry did not just happen when the pastor was in the pulpit. Church became a living, breathing, active presence of God in the world where Jesus, John Wesley was once quoted as saying, the world is my parish. And this early footprint for ministry that began with the Methodist movement translated really well to the new world where a new government was being formed, a government that gave power and responsibility to the citizens. It was in that environment that the polity for the United Methodist Church was also being developed and written into what is now our Book of Discipline. And that polity has become a framework that empowers the laity, the regular, not ordained people, to claim their mantle of ministry. 
In some denominations, the organization, the policy, the power of the church is dictated by the clergy. In the United Methodist Church, our polity is shaped by the cooperative efforts of clergy and laity. When we meet together in conferences, annual conferences and general conference, which is the meeting of the worldwide church, the clergy and laity are equally represented and have equal vote. And while that is a statement of how the power and leadership is structured, more importantly, that is a reflection of how we see the responsibility to achieve the mission of the church, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. You are a minister. When I was a music minister, I used to tell the children in my children's choirs before they'd go out and sing to the congregation, I'd say, you know, Pastor Martin and I are ministers, but you also are a minister. And today, you're going to be the ministers of the church. You're going to tell the people all about how much Jesus loves them as you sing your song to them today. And you could see on their faces as they processed that, that they were going to do something that was important and they were going to do this special work for Jesus. Children are ministers. Children can share the love of Jesus in ways that move people's hearts. I know you've all seen it. Children are ministers. And youth, like Julia Drosha, who stood before the Michigan Annual Conference and spoke truth to them, Julia is a minister. And Ryan Beridge, who stood up here one Sunday to talk, give his own personal witness of generosity, Ryan is a minister. And Mike Buckner, who leads us in serving the homeless in downtown Lansing, Mike is a minister. And I can go through the entire list of our members and friends, and I bet I can find something about each and every one of you that reflects God's active work in you, calling you to ministry. You are a minister. When you join or affiliate with the United Methodist Church, you better gear up. Open your heart and get ready, because you are a minister of the church. And I think it's important to, to know and to always remember our call to ministry, because it not only gives us a sense of purpose, it also reminds us to tend to our conduct. When we're aware of the fact that we're a minister, we guard our words more carefully. We monitor our, our actions more carefully. So if you are a minister, what am I? Why do I wear this robe and have the title of pastor or reverend? Another feature of our church is the understanding that some people are particularly called into ordained ministry. Ordained meaning set apart by God for leadership. And in the United Methodist Church, we recognize the calling of two distinct types of ordained clergy. And this is a little different from other denominations. We recognize the ordination of deacons and the ordination of elders. Deacons are called to specialized ministry. They are ordered in word, service, compassion, and justice. They tend to serve in specialized ministries that may be associated with a particular church or might be out in the world, not attached to a church at all. And the function of their ministry is to bridge that gap between the church and the world and to serve as that conduit that brings people to the church and sends people out from the church. Elders are called to a slightly different ministry. They are called to order the life of the church. Their prim primary responsibility is to shepherd the church, to lead and to guide. And they are called to order, word, service, and sacrament. Clergy attend seminary and get a master's degree in their field of ministry, or in the case of an elder, they get a master's of divinity. They go through a long and detailed discernment process and examination process where the Board of Ordained Ministry examines their calling and their gifts for leadership to see and to see if they are a, a living a life that models set-apart ministry. 
It's hard to lead with authority, with authenticity, if you aren't living the role out, right? And once they've passed all the levels of competency and examination, they are commissioned for ministry and remain in a provisional status for no less than three years before they undergo another round of examinations. And if they pass, then they become a fully ordained minister or pastor. Just as a side note, I am an ordained deacon in the process of transferring my orders to elder. Out of the order of elders, some are further called and elected to serve as bishops in the episcopacy. In order to be a bishop, you have to have served as an elder, and you go through an election process by the conference made up of clergy and laity. Bishops order the life of the greater church and are responsible for the appointment of clergy to the local church. I thought it important that you understand this aspect of organizational feature of our church, but it's not the most important thing that I'm going to say to you this morning. If 10 minutes from now you can't tell me the difference between a deacon and an elder and a bishop, that is not a big deal. And it won't get you booted out of the United Methodist Church. But if 10 minutes from now you forget that you're a minister, that would be a tragedy. If 10 minutes from now you forget that you are a unique and necessary part of the body of Christ, that would also be a tragedy. And if 10 minutes from now you forget that you are the church, that we together are the church, that the church is more than a building with a steeple, it's us acting and serving as the body of Christ together, then I'm not sure what the future of the church can possibly be. You and me and all of us together have been brought together by the Holy Spirit in a mad rush of energy that is joy and love and gifts and purpose and that is about sharing the love of God and helping people grow in faith. And that makes us church together. We are the body of Christ called to love God and to love God's people. We are the church called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is what we believe. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit which stirs us to a higher purpose of ministry in Jesus' name, that we might be a blessing to your people, that we might be an expression of light and life and love in this world, transforming it into the kingdom you have designed. Inspire us each day to rise and be the church, to live our lives in service and witness to your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray as one body, one church. Amen. Sunday, we will continue our series, What We Believe, 
as we explore our understanding of the Bible and how we interpret God's word. Next Saturday, I'm going to be doing a wedding um, off-site, and uh, because of the complications of seeing a bunch of people that I don't normally see and so forth, um, I am going to be laying low this coming week in preparation for that. I'm going to work from home, so if you are looking to find me, just give me a call. I'm happy to, to chat with you, but I won't be in the church office this week. And then in the week following the wedding, I will definitely be quarantining because I have no idea where these people um, have come from so uh, I will uh, quarantine again still you are free to call me and I'm happy to chat with you but I won't be in the church office if you would like to join uh, faith chat for a further discussion on what was talked about in today's sermon or to bring your suggestions about other things that you want to know about with regards to what we believe is United Methodist please call the church office or send me an email and I'll make sure you get linked up on the zoom uh, call so that uh, you can join our conversation please join us in our closing hymn the spirit sends us forth to serve into the world and into the weeks ahead ever mindful that you have been called to be a minister and that you are the church you have been made for such a time as this we have been brought together to make a difference in this world may God bless you and give you courage and strength for the ministry to which you have been called go in God's peace amen <laughs>